Left Foot Club's anti-capitalism series with Gargi Bhattacharya. Uh, today, on our, the third uh, event of this series, we'll be discussing anti-capitalism and care. And I suppose, arguably, it's one of the most crucial discussions we need to be having right now. We're very, very excited to have two incredible thinkers and writers all under one virtual roof. So really glad that you're all tuning in with us tonight. Um, just a little bit about the Left Book Club. The Left Book Club is a subscription book service and not-for-profit initiative. We seek to foster a spirit of collective learning and political education. We want to create spaces and avenues where people can learn from each other and discuss radical ideas that inform actions and practical steps. We aim to support the struggles fighting for us all. Our events feature speakers such as Kate Mann, Grace Blakely, Kojo Karam, Lewis Gordon, uh, our very own, very own Gargi Bhattacharya, Harsha Walia, Lola Olafemi, Dahlia Gabriel, and our discussions engage with a wide range of radical thought. During this event, don't forget to ask your questions on the YouTube live stream chat, and at the end, there'll definitely be a chance for them to be uh, answered. If you would like to become a, become a member of the Left Book Club, please visit, visit leftbookclub.com and uh, subscribe to our mailing list at the bottom of our homepage. The links are in the description of the YouTube live stream that you are watching. And please don't forget to follow us, the Left Book Club on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And while you're watching us tonight, subscribe to our YouTube channel. So today's event is again, like I said, um, a part of our anti-capitalism ser anti series, because in 2020, as we've said in previous uh, sessions, the UK government barred anti-capitalist education materials from schools, dubbing it as, quote, an extreme political stance. The policy, which has been referred to by commentators as McCarthyist, goes even further, further than any British government has gone, even during the Cold War. So we've all organized this series with Gargi Bhattacharya to explore what we're all thinking. Why is the UK government afraid of anti-capitalism? Why is it being barred from school, schools and why now? And also actually perhaps even more crucially, how can we teach anti-capitalism? So for, for March today, we are thrilled to announce that we'll be discussing anti-capitalism in care with Gargi and our two incredible guests, Silvia Federici and Camille Barbagello. So Gargi, as you all know, is one of the UK's leading scholars on race and capitalism. She is the author of Rethinking Racial Capitalism, Dangerous Brown Men, Traffic, and co-author of her latest book um, published by Pluto Press, Empire's Endgame. Silvia Federici is a writer, teacher, and one of the most influential contemporary feminist theorists. In the 1970s, she was, she was one of the co-founders of the International Feminist Collective, the organization that launched the Wages for, House, the Wages for Housework campaign internationally. In the 1990s, after a period of teaching and research in Nigeria, she was active in the anti-globalization movement and the US anti-death penalty movement. Camille Barbagello is a feminist activist and organizer with the Women's Strike Assembly and works as researcher at the University of Leeds on the ESRC childcare during COVID-19 research project. Engaging specifically with Marxist feminist theories of social reproduction, she examines, she examines the value of social reproduction, what it costs and who pays the bill. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to Gargi and um, we'll all be hearing some very incredible presentations tonight. Well, thanks so much for that, Elif, and thank you to all of you for coming on a Friday evening. We've never done a Friday before. You see, we're encroaching more and more into your proper leisure time. Um, and I'm so excited about today's event that I really think that some of the things we can talk about today will be just addressing the questions on so many of our lips. Elif has already talked a little bit about social reproduction because of course both Sylvia and Camille are kind of experts in that area of debate. But as we always say for these sessions, you don't have to have read the books to have come to the conversation. So just to reprise that, to remember that when we talk about social reproduction amongst um, anti-capitalists, we're talking about all of the range of activity that's needed to remake life. And I'd say not just our lives, but all, all life on the planet for the whole planet's well-being. But what capitalism does is it narrows social reproduction to only be the reproduction of labour power. And 
um, the remaking of life for the purposes of capital. So that's already a distinction between our well-being and survival and what cap capitalism does to the purposes of life. So you might want to keep that in mind for when we chat a bit more. Again, as Elif has already pointed out, for um, Marxist and socialist feminists for decades, there's been a debate about where does housework fall within this, um, this remaking of life that's never acknowledged. That, you know, that housework collapses all of the kind of dirty work and emotional work that lets us live, but it's unacknowledged largely in accounts of the economy even now. There have been some moves even amongst liberal economists to address that, but broadly, when they talk about the economic dip we're in, they don't mean people have stopped doing the childcare and the washing up. When they talk about the crisis in the global economy, they don't mean the business that keeps us all alive, that that's stopped, because that clearly hasn't stopped. So that raises a question for all of us in our will to anti-capitalism about how we think about what human beings do on the planet and for what purpose. But I also hope we're gonna to talk today a little bit about uh, anti-capitalist imaginations. People who've been to these sessions before will know that part of it is about what's wrong with the now, but part of it is how we speak to each other about some other better future. And um, as I've already said, and other people in the room will say better than me, the future of our species and the whole planet requires ways of imagining care. That, that we need to think about ways of imagining care that retrieve care from that exploitative framing that capital gives us. I have some other notes. In particular, I think we need to think about how do we imagine care in a better future? You know, we, we're not doctrinaire on this series. Again, people who've come before will know. If you're broadly kind of unhappy with how this world is made now, come and have that conversation with us. We don't care which paper you're selling or which particular interpretation of which work you're with. That's not our game. But we are kind of saying for everyone who feels that this current world is not enough, not enough for any of us to live the lives that we were born to live, how can we speak together about what a better future would be? And while we might struggle together um, you, know, you know, to build some kind of world where human and interspecies and planetary well-being replace the will to profit and accumulation, you know, that I think is quite a broad aim, but maybe all of us in the room share. Whatever happens next, whatever we win, there will still be a need for us and for all other living things for some kind of way of caring around our interdependency, our mortality, our occasional frailty, perhaps increasing frailty as the world folds in on us, and the ways in which we need each other in unpredictable and sometimes painful ways. I can't imagine any anti-capitalist future that thinks somehow we'll have a vision of future life where those things won't still be in place. And that means unlike exploitative waged work, we have to think about what would be an, a caring framework whenever we get to the better world we're all moving towards, we hope. So I hope some of those questions, both why care is erased now and also how we imagine a care outside of these exploitative frameworks, that that be in the mix of how we talk today. Because surviving better must be the answer. Okay, I'll move on. And next, first, I forgot I meant to do the, forgot that, that I meant to do the um, segue in. So I'm so overexcited to say that Sylvia is going to speak next and people in the room will know that if there's one person you wanna hear talk about this question in the world, this person must be the one. So welcome, welcome, and thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you, Gajin. Thank you all and all the people that are listening. Um, the question of care work is, uh, and care in general, it's a very good entry to a discussion about an anti-capitalist struggle, an anti-capitalist program, because uh, as you said, care has to do with the reproduction of life. And uh, it's so clear when you look at care work and care in general, that uh, capitalism is not interested in reproducing our life except to exploit us as workers. 
And uh, I see that what we have witnessed in uh, the last year, in this terrible year, you know, it's been a culmination of a crisis that has been growing because uh, the crisis and the pre-existing condition that has made our life so precarious and has led to so many deaths is capitalism itself. Capitalism is the pre-existing condition that uh, has made so many people you know, vulnerable. And uh, because what we have witnessed now you know, has been, first of all, historic devaluation of the productive work. We have been talking about it. We have been struggling in the feminist movement, some of us in particular, the devaluation of all the work of reproduction, which is really devaluation of life. You know, when you do not consider the work that every day, you know, in a sense, allows people to live, uh, that's what you are, in fact, uh, devaluing. And uh, this has escalated continuously despite the women's movement, because to the extent the more and more women have migrated into wage work, we have seen a constant hand, you know, almost simultaneous defunding a simultaneous defunding of even the meager, the meager investment that after World War II, you know, had been directed towards social reproduction. And uh, I'm less uh, you know, cognizant of the situation in, uh, in, in, in the UK. And we always, you know, romanticize Europe because the United States situation is so terrible that we always think that, oh, in Europe must be better. But what we are seeing in the United States is every service, whatever small amount of funding has been devoted to services, has been systematically cut every year. Uh, Whether it has been childcare, today is sending you know, a child to childcare. Some, some friend of mine tell me I might as well send my child to the university because it is as expensive. Um, senior centers home care, some help for people who are not completely self-sufficient. All of that, not to mention what is taking place in the hospital, where, for instance, uh, an aide, a nurse, instead of having five person to care for, now has 10. So it's, it's a situation, the, the mortality, uh, the high rate number of people have died in the nursing home and in the hospital are really uh, a direct, a very predictable, is, you know, chronicle of an announced death. This could have been completely predicted. COVID had exploded a situation that had been uh, intensifying, you know, over the year. And at the center of that situation is the majority women. Women who have been pulled in every direction, you know, with work week, you know, matching the work week of the Industrial Revolution with no time for, for the creation, no time for recuperation. You know, often having, you know, a job outside their home, children, relatives, uh, pair, you know, family to, to care, chronic people with chronic illnesses and so forth, right? So the question now is, this is a turning point and, who is going to determine the shape of the future? The situation is untenable. Something has to give. Um, we see now, for example, women are denouncing, are coming out every day denouncing that they cannot go on because they are at home with children now, in addition to the house, in addition to the work outside the home or the telework, they now also have to care for their schooling. But there's no, absolutely no response. Much of the discussion is whether schools should stay open or should not stay open. And what we need instead is really a mass mobilization that changes completely the ground of the discussion. And uh, we had a talk with Camille before the beginning of the program. And as Camille was saying, and I think it's so profound, that in order to really address the question of care work and care, we have to transform the whole of society. 
you know, and it's not a matter of uh, an extra tax credit. It's not a matter of whether only the school are going to stay open or not open, or as important as those reductive programs. But nevertheless, we really have to re-envision the organization of reproductive work at all levels. Gazia was very uh, happy that you stress the care work is not only the home, family relation, housework, but it's the care for the environment. People have been dying uh, because of the air is so polluted. Uh, people have been dying because the immunity system has been damaged, undermined by years and years of eating fast food, of eating food uh, you know, grown with pesticide and so forth. So the question of care really implies, you know, a reconstruction, a reconstruction of every aspect, you know, of every activity that goes into reproducing our life in, in social relation. And I think that this is where we need truly a massive women's mobilization. Women, and of course, in the broad sense of the word, including all known gender conforming subjects, but we need a kind of mobilization over the question of reproduction because we know that the state is going to give us anything. The state, we cannot expect from the state, which does not mean that we can ignore the state. The state has the monopoly of our wealth. The state has the control of, of the wealth that we have produced, the generation has produced. So it's not a question of organizing our life, you know, depending only on our bootstraps, but it's a question of devising a mobilization that simultaneously, you know, organizes on, on uh, you know, what has the capacity to create spaces of collective decision-making, of collective debate, where we begin to decide what do we need because not necessarily the needs that we have will be the same in every situation. But they begin the discussion of what do we need, whether it is in terms of services, whether it is how we control the services that the state, we may be able to win from the state. In terms of resources, we need to rechannel the flow of wealth uh, to in the direction of reproductive work. So, but see, and we also need to reorganize reproductive work itself in a way that is more cooperative, in a way that is less isolating, in a way that breaks down, you know, this idea of the private life and so forth. So we need to create infrastructure at the community level. And I see, you know, in my, in my, in my work, and uh, I more and more see the need to move uh, in terms of a transformative intervention on the question of care and care work to move simultaneously at different levels, at the level of resources, at the level of services, and at the same time, at the level of the reorganization of the work itself. And I think uh, hopefully and I conclude here um, you no, know, this so crucial moment, right? This this uh, turning point, you know, and uh, what we have learned about uh, the alternative, what we have learned about what will what we are facing if change does not come, what we are facing, you know, is what is going to energize, you know, a new feminist initiative on a very, very broad level. To really, as Camille was saying, transform care work by first of all, transform all our social relations. Because in order to transform care work, we need also to change the organization of work outside the home. We need time, we need to liberate our time to be able, in fact, if you are completely consumed by telework, even if you do in the home, if you are completely consumed, you will not be able, in fact, you know, to, to care for the friend, to care for, uh, and, uh, and their mobilization has to bring together women are doing, our people are doing, 
you know, care work on an unpaid basis and care workers who are actually doing the work on, on uh, as, as a paid job, as paid employment. That kind of coming together between paid domestic workers, we have seen a strong, you know, domestic workers movement. They so far are those who have put on the table the issue of care work in a way that I feel the feminist movement has not yet done. I hope that is going to change. <clears throat> Thank you so much. That was just wonderful and covered so much ground. So we're going to go straight on to our next speaker and I'm going to bring in Camille now. Thanks so much. Thanks so much um, uh, for inviting me along tonight and also what an honour and pleasure to be able to speak after both Gagi and Sylvia. I suppose I wanted to talk tonight a little bit about um, childcare, um, like kind of jump straight down and down into some of the nuts and bolts and kind of the um, what's usually pretty mundane and no one ever really ever invites you to talk on panels about childcare in a funny kind of way. Um, but I wanted to kind of think about what happened in January of this year in the United Kingdom and when we were at the beginning of um, the deadliest uh, wave uh, that we've had um, of the pandemic and the UK government decided um, to keep open early years childcare and education for everyone um, and decided to close all other educational and care um, services, schools, FE colleges um, and universities. Uh, so one of the reasons I want to talk about that is because I organize with the Women's Strike Assembly um, and we've been thinking and organizing and taking action around care and the politics of care for a number of years now, um, drawing inspiration from movements predominantly in Latin America around um, International Women's Day, which has just happened again, and the Women's Strike. Um, and that's really led us to thinking about one of the insights from Sylvia's work and from um, uh, feminist the theory, theory and feminist thinking around social reproduction, around this dual character of care. And Gargi's already talked about one of them, which is that when we do social reproductive work, we both reproduce our ability to be a worker um, and to make money for the capitalist class, but we also reproduce life and that those two things are not actually the same thing and that they um, a lot of the time are actually in tension with each other. And then, then I think there's another couple of other dualities uh, that I think Sylvia was also talking about, which is the alliance between those who need care and those who provide care um, and those two kind of processes. And we might chuck in the mix the kids who get cared for as well in terms of they often get left out of the matrix when we talk about care. Um, or the elderly people or the people with um, different needs. So uh, when the government made this decision to keep open early years, um, I was in a chat with lots of different childcare workers because we were in the process of organizing ch a childcare workers branch. Um, and in the end, I decided to write down kind of seven of the key points that I was really angry about with this decision. And some of it came on the back of like Sylvia was talking about uh, thinking about why the feminist movement doesn't kind of get it when it comes to care. There's a lot of self-care, there's a lot of candles, you're instructed to take a hell of a lot of baths at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of care that goes on in relation, everyone's very interested in care, it really is a turning point. Everyone wants to bring care to the center of their politics and for, to make sure that they tick the box when it comes to um, having a, care, a politics around care. But nonetheless, they didn't kind of get it in terms of what happened in January. And so I think it's really important that we talk about reproductive justice. Um, and when we think about reproductive justice, we actually put childcare into it, right? So that means that childcare is as important as abortion to the feminist struggle. And it's certainly as important to feminist reproductive, to politics around feminist um, reproductive justice. So just to think about that, that means that reproductive justice exp expands to meaning bodily autonomy, control over how we birth and unbirth our children, i.e. the abortion bit, but it also means access to the necessary resources to care and raise our kids if we choose to have them, right? And so the, the second point is that the failure to see the importance of childcare, that it's not just pushing people around in a buggy, um, as unglamorous as that may be. Um, there was a famous, in the 1970s, a poet um, 
and made a famous quote that I'll try to find during our conversation to, to give you a good instance of how women have been talking about childcare for a number of years. I should have organized it for this talk. Uh, so when we think about childcare, we've got to think about how it's organized, how it's funded, crucially, uh, who it's for and what it does. Um, and that when we don't think about these things, we do the work of capital, right? We make it, re we make it invisible again, we make it mundane and unglamorous and not worth talking or thinking about. And as Sylvia, has been talking about as she was just saying to me on the phone for many many years now the, the point is is that care work or an expanded definition of care work to mean all of reproductive work is as Gargi said the work that makes all other work possible right so it's actually at the, the heart of capital in that way so the decision of the government to keep open nurseries during the third lockdown in the UK was a deliberate attempt by the Tories to calculate, it was a deliberate and calculated attempt, I would say, to pit some women's interests against uh, workers' interests in terms of safety um, and dignity. So the project of neoliberalism is alive and well, right, during the pandemic and it's playing out in the politics of care. Um, and in that way, we can see that the neoliberal feminist politics of choice, and we've heard a lot about choice over the years, but not anywhere near as much as during the pandemic, right? Because the pandemic is like this laboratory of neoliberalism uh, where all of the, you know, the, the, <laughs> the old cast have come out again and have been wheeled out to do their great lines. And so in some ways, I'd argue that the feminist politics, the liberal feminist politics of choice, which is, your right to supposedly choose what's best for you and your family in the marketplace, that's the neoliberal choice that you've been given, uh, is only made possible, that politics of choice and the idea that you, you can go out there and choose loads of different things through rendering other women's non-choices invisible. And I'll make the point really quickly in terms of these two things. Um, Neoliberalism is, an, is a political project that makes you, not the state and never capital, responsible for all of the choices and the non-choices that you supposedly now make. Like the choice to see your nan at Christmas or the choice to send your child to a nursery during a global pandemic. By keeping nurseries open, the, the government deliberately put some women's needs for childcare above the needs of childcare workers to work in a safe environment and not die from COVID, right? Like that was actually the choice that was being made. It meant that childcare workers didn't have the choice not to go to work or not, like lots of other people did. Uh, if nurseries were closed, uh, except for key worker children, then childcare workers would have had access to furlough and like schools, the emergency effort around the pandemic could have actually been handled in a better way. By keeping nurseries open, it also made it impossible for working mothers to request childcare furlough, right? So it not only uh, does a number on the health, dignity and rights of childcare workers, it also made it more difficult for working mothers um, and working parents in general. Because taking their children out of nursery, which is what the science required us to do in January, became our choice. Right. And when it's our choice, then you can be punished and responsible for your choice, i.e. that you don't have any childcare and you've still got a job to do, which is what I've been doing all of January and February and March. Uh, so the decision to keep nurseries open forced more women to do a triple shift of waged work, housework and full time childcare. And so I just in even in looking through that really simple little government decision that happened in relation to care in the UK, I think we can start to see some of the coordinates about whose lives were valued, whose work was made more important, whose work was vi visible. And also that um, I think that there's the, the pandemic has been a masterclass. In fact, you could, you, it's like being taught in a university on the role and value of reproduction, right? But I think one of the things that I've learned through the pandemic is that visibility, just being visible, isn't enough, right? It, like the NHS, we've had a lot of clapping for people. There's been some visibility there. Um, Childcare and education has been made more visible to people than ever before because it's been withdrawn, right? And, and people have had to manage it inside of their homes. But visibility is not enough. We, and so the, the project around revaluing re uh, care work and re social reproduction has to be more than just a claim to visibility and representation. And I think that that claim lies in organizing both reproductive workers who work for a wage and organizing people who do so in an unwaged uh, capacity and thinking about the alliances between those two groups of people and the fact that some people exist in both. 
All right, thanks very much. Thank you, Camille, that was great. And I really hope that people who don't live in Britain understood the huge political significance of what Camille was describing there, because I think it goes across many different locations during this period. So what we normally do now is that we start to chat and I hope that chat will also come up through the comments bit that you can do. So please do add things on your know, comments or chat. Um, it's not like a political meeting, so you don't get to give a big speech. I look forward to that day again when people can give a big speech and say, I have a comment, not a question. But please do add comments, whatever. But um, because it's kind of, you know, I'm one of the people who runs this show, I get to ask them first questions. And the first question is this thing that has really been bothering me and both Silver and Camille kind of touched on it in different ways about whether whether capital does still want our care work in the same way, or to the same extent or in the same shape. Because we seem to be living through a time when there's less and less investment in reconstructing workers. That's partly what Sylvia said, even those slight concessions from the state that we might have seen one generation ago are all collapsing in Britain as well, collapsing differently to the states, but still a kind of almost total collapse. And in other ways, we seem to have seen a kind of disinterest in reconstructing the working class as a whole, perhaps some bits, but not others. I think that feeds into what Camille is saying about who can get furlough or not. I should just say, because I don't know where everyone is located in Britain, furlough meant that for some kinds of work, um, if your employer said that the business could not run because of the pandemic, there was a state subsidy um, for 80% of your wages. A very unexpected kind of state initiative for this right-wing government but made a huge difference to many households, but was very unevenly spread across kinds of work and who, who that kind of emergency recognition that these people just can't live unless we do something, who that went to. But also not only around furlough, that we're seeing the pandemic has shown if we, if we didn't understand it before, who is absolutely dispensable, whose life is not even worth the energy of saving, whose care we're, disinterested in. I didn't remember to bring out the figure, but um, disability campaigning groups in Britain are showing that in terms of deaths in this country, and you know, Britain is trying to win that global death toll as a per capita number, it's hugely disproportionate in terms of um, disabled people. You know, not just a little bit, it's like, you know, it's almost like um, eugenics by um, neglect. And so that makes me kind of wonder, has capitalism really lost interest in some aspects of our care work? Or is capital not interested in reproducing the whole class anymore? And I kind of wondered if either of you had views on, on that and what, what it is we're seeing with that. Throw some off the boat altogether without any pretense, whereas do this sudden unexpected interventionist saving of some other bits. I hope that makes sense. And yeah. But capitalism has never been interested in reproducing everybody. Capitalism has always had a very, very selective, you know, approach to the question of reproduction, you know, at all levels, you know, beginning with abortion and contraceptive. So some people are denied abortion, some women, because they have to reproduce, they have to keep up the race or the workforce and others have been systematically sterilized. The big campaigns across India, Indonesia, the safari street, all that. And I think this applies to care work as a whole. You know, I know so many people, how many times I've heard, you know, both in the United States and in Europe, you know, they are killing us and they're getting rid of, you know, they've been complaining and complaining so much about the aging population and the aging population and what a stress that is in the United States of social security and et cetera. Well, you know, many people now, you know, are dying in the nursing home and you don't have to have a conspiracy theory, but the reality is that those nursing homes, the publicly, the public nursing home, to which mostly women go. Because in many cases, you know, women who have stayed home to take care of others, when it comes their turn, 
to be taken care of. They don't have anybody. And so they will be the ones who will go into publicly subsidized nursing home. And they have been systematically underfunded. So, you know, there is a very selective, a very selective approach. And I think it's also important to see that on one level, you know, they, there is a really drive that has been going on quite invisibly for a number of years also to intensify you know, the, the care work that is taking place in the home. Whereas it appears that uh, with women working more and more outside of the home, you know, the amount of burden housework has been reduced, but actually this has not been the case, both because the services have been cut, but also because more work has been pushed in. For example, I don't know about Britain, but the United States, a lot of uh, healthcare, healthcare provision and uh, that were taking place in the past in public uh, institutions, like in clinics, have been pushed into the home. So that you have, for instance, uh, you know, companies producing medical equipment who are now producing instruments for dialysis with the idea that it will be done in the kitchen or in the bedroom, right? So that's also the other part that we need to rethink, that there's been also a flowback into the home of all kinds of, and I think one of the fear also is that, uh, you know, in capital's plan, you know, the, the pandemic, it's a, it's a trial, it's a test of how much domestic work, how much care work they can actually push back into the home. And uh, the, the fact that they do not care, they seem not to care, is because, in fact, uh, you know, reproduction has become a very direct uh, form of accumulation. We talk about the financialization of reproduction, right? No sooner women have been able to have a, a wage of their own that all of a sudden, right, you have all this uh, commercialized, commercialized form of care. So that you spend, you have to spend the money that you earn, right, in uh, now purchasing what in the past that uh, you know you may have done or somebody in the family may have done. So again, the interest is, but it's a selective interest. It's a selective interest. Not every every part of the working class of the proletarian, you know, is of value or uh, capitalism is very selective in whom uh, will be reproduced or not and under what condition. And that's why also the conversation has to be one that recognizes the whole impact of racial hierarchy, the whole impact also of age hierarchy and, uh, and the situation of those who do not fit into the citizenship model, you know, immigrant work. I mean, the, the, one of the uh, group of women who has been uh, most victimized, you know, in COVID is by migrant women you know, who in many cases for months and months could not were uh, disemployed by the family in which they work. And at the same time, did not qualify for any kind of subsidy, right? So there is a indifference clearly of the state, you know, to, to the suffering and so on. But, um, Yes, care work is needed, but not for all. <laughs> I think that there's also a possibility to pick up this idea around who cares about care work a little bit as well, because I, I definitely agree that capital has this incredibly selective, um, you know, it's like plays favorites, right? Like the favorite in the class it gets all of the goodies um, and everyone else gets sent uh, an, to isolation. Uh, but I also think that there's been a willful uh, uh, uncaringness about uh, the conditions that care workers, for instance, work under. And so uh, it's only been, um, sorry, I just set something for light on my desk. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Um, and so, uh, 
you know, we're talking about like if we go back to the care industry, but also um, the union that we've been organizing child care workers with have also been organizing elder care workers recently. Those workers in the north of London have done what seemingly the rest of the trade union movement were unable to do for the last 40 years, which is unionize an elder care center, uh, an elder care, care facility, organize with workers and take them out on strike to organize for a decent wages and conditions. United Voices of the World have managed to do that um, in a couple of months when um, some of the major trade unions are still kind of you know, hand gazing about how difficult it is to organize um, essential uh, workers. Um, and that is that I think that as customers, um, that, that some of these divisions that capitalism um, has been able to, you know, exploit and then really massify and generalize in the last 40 years through the commodification of um, reproduction means that, you know, we don't talk about the fact that like, you know, care work is minimum wage jobs. Uh, during the pandemic, it's been revealed that childcare workers don't have access to sick pay beyond statutory sick pay. So the whole circle of how and why you get sick all the time at home uh, and why nurseries are those incubators of viruses and diseases, not just Corona, is because workers can't even take time off when they're getting sick from when you send your, when you send your kid in a bit poorly because you've got to go to work. And then the whole thing, uh, you know, continues around. And so I thought about um, this insight I had the other night when I was thinking about this talk and I was thinking about care work and I was thinking about the pandemic and how we've all been feeling. Um, and I thought that one of the insights that might be useful for people to think about and maybe have some empathy and, and solidarity around was around how the pandemic has really reduced lots of people's lives to the state of new motherhood. And so I say that in terms of trying to really talk about what we do to people who've just had children. And that, and that is that we isolate them, we stick them in the home, we make them feel incredibly vulnerable. Uh, we load them up with care that they've never had to do before and they don't really have much of a guidebook to know how to do it. Um, we don't pay them very much money. <laughs> we don't give them any money. Uh, and we make the whole process as kind of difficult and as dehumanizing as possible. Um, and I think that what the pandemic has showed us uh, is around that the, the, the problem is, is, is those conditions of new motherhood, right? And, and that we actually need to work on what we do to people in the home um, and how, um, how the home is operating in terms of this kind of economy and matrix around care. Um, and that requires us to give a shit basically about who's doing care work as well for us and for our elders and for our children and for lots of different people. And to really think about the role that that work plays, that minimum work, minimum wage work plays in relation to facilitating our ability to uh, go out and, and do work and that interdependency that we have um, and the real possibility that we have of making different demands. I wanted to pick up a little bit on that kind of idea around what kinds of worlds do we need and what kinds of utopias and demands do we need to get out of this mess. And one of them has to be that care can't just be reduced to this capitalist functionalist uh, demand that just enables and facilitates overwhelmingly female labor to go out in the workforce and to be exploited ourselves. Um, and in that way, I think that we can bring back, uh, we can make capital care about care work, right? Like I think that is bringing capital to heal is really uh, what the next kind of uh, 10 years to 20 years is gonna look like. No, oh, thanks so much. That was, um, you know, both so helpful and um, important for people to hear. Um, I was just gonna say in passing about trade unions, I wonder also, and people won't, Again, if people are not in Britain, or perhaps even if they're not in London, they might not know that have been a series of very militant disputes, largely around London, led by so-called independent unions. And in Britain, that means unions that are not affiliated to the Trade Union Congress, you know, and, and often are working primarily with migrant workers or minoritized workers. But um, it's just my feeling as someone who's been in the trade union movement for a long time is that it's not so much that mainstream unions don't know how to reach workers in those kinds of fields. There's a question about what the value for those trade unions would be to do that. So workers in those marginalized or precarious forms of work are likely to be militant and likely to be in dispute a lot of the time. And that sadly is not good business for the mainstream trade union movement. 
Now that's something for all of us to think about if we think organized labor is one element of how the world is made better. Um, what does it mean to have created a trade union movement when it's a problem if some forms of work are, are likely to be in dispute with their employer a lot of the time? Because that is not the business model of mainstream trade unions. That's for another day, I think, that conversation. Um, I'm going to ask my question then, explain why I'm asking it. I absolutely hear what both of you are saying, and I'm very pleased that Sylvia has made it clear that often the distinctions of which part of the working class capital cares enough to reproduce a little is highly racialized, highly nationalized. You know, it's about race and nation really in Britain and I think across the world, whether it's worth reproducing you and then issues around Asian disability feed into that as well. But as um, people's experience of work has changed, I kind of have a question as more and more work becomes more and more precarious, not only the very low paid work, but work which even 10 or 20 years ago was not so precarious. What kind of care work is required to remake the precariat? And um, has that wash of precarity changed how we think about practices and spaces of care? And I guess alongside that, I'd say, I really hear what Camille is saying about the need to make, to make bring capital to heal. But I also am very aware that for those parts of the work of of our society who are left in neglect, any kind of sense that um, either a collective or a state intervention in your care work could happen just feels like a further threat. I imagine what, what that would feel like. And we already know that in this, in Britain, issues that were supposed to be supportive when they still existed, such as health visiting, um, if you have a new child, a health visitor is meant to come to you, but for poor migrant racialized women, that was never a supportive process. That was always a policing process. Everything that was ever won for some sections of women was just another way of bringing the cops to your door for another section of women. And so all of those conversations feel like, until we fix some of those things between us, even the demand feels like, you know, you're getting me and my kids arrested again, or you're getting my kids taken away again. There's been a horrible story going through the British press at the moment about kids who've been put into care um, because they didn't, they were on a weight loss plan. And so this was a kind of high, you know, real micromanagement of the physicality of, of, a, of a disempowered household. And, you know, people, it's not, and we know which households are disempowered enough that what I feed my kids can get them taken away. So I just kind of wondered what, in a world of increasingly precarious work, has care work changed? I'm not sure if that's a clear question. Because, you know, the care work we think of is a different model of work often of like a worker and a wife, basically. I don't know if that makes sense enough for either of you to say something. Sorry, not being very clear. I can jump in here. Sylvia, you can go after me. You were on mute. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm saying that it makes a lot of sense because it speaks to the situation that already exists and a situation to which in different ways, uh, women in particular have tried to give some response. Because for example, I've been saying, and again, I speak for the United States, uh, you know, they care because of this investment, et cetera, has become quite expensive for most people. So you have, you know, workers, women workers who are earning nothing and they can afford that. And so what has been happening already at the community level, in poor community, proletarian community, immigrant community, you have often what is taking place is, uh, you know, women who don't have an extra domestic, you know, employment who are taking care of the kids of other women. And, uh, and one of the struggles, and this has been happening not only, I mean, in the United States, but we know, for instance, uh, of experiences in other countries, also in response to the fact, for example, situation of warfare, where a lot of people being killed, a lot of children being abandoned in the streets, I'm thinking here in Colombia, you know, women began to, um, the, 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 
women in, in the neighborhood to take the children in and organize their reproduction and then fight with the state to get the resources, you know, to care for them. And uh, here in uh, the 60s and until the early 70s, for instance, in many black communities, the same thing was happening. You know, you organize, you want to know who's taking care, how your children are being cared, you know, precisely from that concern, who, who's coming into the community, who's, and then fighting to see, to get the resources to do uh, that work. So that situation is already there. And, and that's why I was arguing that uh, the struggle, if we are thinking of a mass mobilization, we have to think of fighting at different fronts at the same time. You know, in the question of, for instance, the question of control. I think you're absolutely right. People are afraid who's going to come into your kitchen, who is going to come you know, into your community and being able also to decide what is going to happen to my, to those children, right? That, uh, and I'm using the children as one example. So I think that the issue of, you know, uh, the ability to communally, collectively, you know, organize structures of reproduction in the community and at the same time, being able to you know, organize you know, intervention that reclaim, you know, reclaim in whatever form, whether it could be a building, whether it could be money, whether it could be a service, but reclaim the, the process of reclaiming the wealth that now is not placed at the service of reproduction. That these are the two major direction in which we have to go. Because now the precarization of work Certainly, it has to come to an end, you know, the, the, the situation that we have now. The healthcare insurance is connected to your job, right? And uh, I think that, that what happened with, with COVID has shown that this is a bankrupt practice because now there's so many people have lost their job, you know, they've lost their medical insurance. And so, but this is already, the crisis was already there because with the precarization of work, fewer and fewer people over the years have been able to actually have access to healthcare, you know, in, 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 a, in a secure way, you know? So this is what I think has, has to happen. And of course, you know, in the United States, there is a big struggle, you know, for uh, nationalized medicine, which we do not have. No, we now have a situation that is uh, an hallucination. It's a total, total scandal, right? And uh, with millions of people without having any form of insurance. So, but looking towards the future, right? Looking towards not only responding to emergency, but in terms of transformative, you know, uh, program, that I think uh, is the direction to move to move in the direction of negotiating and, and fighting with the state, reclaiming, and at the same time, having ways in which does not allow the state to control the forms of our reproduction. I think it's a, um, a a really interesting question to also think through how our care work has changed, which I think was part of your question as well. And it's hard to remember a time before the pandemic, to be completely honest with you. And that's got to do with how much care work I've done uh, during the pandemic, um, which has got something to do with my frontal lobe being unable to even remember a time when I didn't have 16 hours a day of my own children every day, all day. Um, and, but I think, there is a degree in which we've seen the kind of commodification um, of everyday life pushing into new areas where capital does that thing of wanting to create new markets, new terrains, previously um, areas of life that had somehow remained outside of those kind of circuits of commodification being sucked. 
massive circuits of commodification. We've seen 24 hour childcare um, emerge in Britain in the last 10 years um, and become more and more prevalent. Um, we've seen, you know, elder care diversify and become financialized and be invested in by private equity firms. There, you know, it, it's, I'm not the first person to note it, nor will I be the last. There really is not a service that you can't buy in, um, in London, from dog walking to toning your bum, uh, to, you know, all of the different ways in which you can command other people's labor to do something to your body. <laughs> Um, and so in that way, like when we think about care in that way, it's really mapping both the kind of extension of the working day into the whole 24 hour cycle and the need to provide services and, and forms of, I would say, capitalist care um, that supports that kind of worker model. Um, at the same time as I think, you're, I think you're right to kind of point to precariousness as a precarity around the stability of the wage and the certainty of the wage. And that's obviously, in your work, you would point to this, you know, a condition that's long been um, something that different communities and different sections of the class have grappled with. This is not a new condition, um, but it's being generalized and, and massified in different ways now, I think in, in uneven ways. Definitely a, a question around age, right? Um, and in, in terms of what it means to, grow up uh, with different common senses, right? Like in terms of, um, you know, I'm in my 40s and have not had a permanent job my whole life. And that just seems kind of normal to me now, um, as where previous generations that would have made me a total and utter failure. <laughs> Um, as we're now, you know, uh, I will, you know, maybe in my 60s get my first permanent contract. Um, that's okay. I'll be working until my 80s or 90s. So I've got lots of time yet to land that elusive permanent job. Um, but in that way, I think the care industry is a capitalist care industry that is, you know, in that way responding to the needs of the kind of worker. And what we've seen, I think it's worth noting in this kind of discussion um, about what we saw is those kind of initial responses to the pandemic and the creation, certainly in Britain, of mutual aid groups, explicitly called mutual aid groups, um, and how some of them very quickly faltered uh, and what the kind of strange fault lines were for a community, not necessarily a class, a community of people trying to come together to grapple with, uh, you know, uh, not not for a long time, generational kind of question around how to deal with a crisis of the scale that we've been dealing with and why they weren't able to deepen and to become antagonistic and to form the kinds of cells that we really needed them to form in terms of um, how to wage class struggle during something like a global pandemic really does require you know, little militant cells on every street kind of thinking about how to share resources and keep people alive. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about the rush towards mutual aid and then the inability to have the political um, confidence and also the organizing confidence to really take them beyond what I think infects most of the British um, kind of politics, which is a politics of charity. And I wonder where that politics of charity sits when we think about care and we think about exchange and um, and dependency and how we do things for other people in relation to care and, and how much of that, particularly in Britain, falls down along a, a, a logic of charity um, and how that really needs to be broken. I mean, thank you very much for, you know, the amazing presentations, the talks, the perspectives from uh, Sylvia, Camille, but also Gargi. I think it's been a very, very incredible conversation. The comments and the questions have been flying in. I'm sorry to anyone whose question may not get answered just because there's been so many. And of course, uh, we don't have that much time. But before I go to the questions, I like to just like have a little like read of the comments because I think it's nice um, to have a sense of what people are also commenting. Some of them are very cute. Um, someone said, uh, Gargi, this is to you, Gargi, your pink, pink walls are iconic. And I thought that just needs a readout. I thought that needs some recognition. So <laughs> um, I'll put that out there. And also, I think it was you who spoke about the tree of Ken. Someone said that's a brilliant idea. Um, 
And, you know, also, you know, some people spoke about the pandemic has been used as an excuse for there being no abortion access in the north of Ireland. So women and pregnant people still having to travel in the pandemic for abortion care. Um, and that's, of course, really crucial to recognize and um, also, um, you know, give it its uh, time uh, in our discussion here as well. There's been a lot of comments. I might try and like go through them as we are, but a lot of people have been saying, um, you know, Camille, Camille's point about choice, uh, for example, the choice to hug your nan is really important. The Tories have very deliberately put the onus and responsibility onto the public throughout this uh, pandemic. And I think that speaks to particularly the neoliberalization of essentially society and that what we've spoken and heard about uh, in this talk. Um, some people commenting and saying, you know, six out of 10 COVID deaths are of disabled people um, and people commenting about, you know, the issues, you know, within unions and uh, migrant workers. Someone said, and I think, again, it needs its um, kind of recognition here is what's been happening to migrant uh, workers in India is truly unforgivable. And of course, solidarity to um, all the workers, I mean, all around the world, of course, but particularly to the um, farmers who have been protesting in India for, um, well, against essentially uh, fascistic policies of the state. Um, yeah, there's like, I mean, I think someone said, uh, again, I think Camille, this, you spoke about like the buggy not being very glamorous and um, someone said actually pushing a buggy can be glamorous for the rich yummy mummies of West London. And again, I, it comes to the class element of everything that you know we were hearing about uh, today. Um, yeah, I think there's, yeah, there's a lot about like COVID lockdowns and stuff, people, and also, especially Gargi, you'll be happy to hear that people have been communicate, com com conversing with each other and you always love that. So people have been responding to, to each other in the comments, which is something that we really want to be able to do in these, com uh, do in these events. Um, yeah, so some of the questions, and I think this goes to um, uh, all three of uh, our speakers uh, this evening. Uh, someone said, sounds like common sense. Why is it so taboo to be anti-capitalist? And I thought, you know, it sounds like a bit of a very kind of comment or question asked in person, but I think it's actually very important to address the question of like taboo and anti-capitalism and stuff. But I won't ask that on its own. So I said, how do we fight against the wage form itself? And does wages for housework and social re reproduction reify the boundaries of the wage form itself? And another question, and these are somewhat related, so I'll ask them all together. Where do you see the role of the cooperative movement in mobilizing towards care? Um, so yeah, maybe this will be our first round. Uh, Sylvia, do you wanna go ahead first and then we'll have Camille and then Gargi. You're on mute. I've, yeah, so the question of wages for housework. Uh, yeah, you know, wages for housework, I've, I've been, I've said it many, many times, and I was not alone, was uh, really a strategy, was uh, not simply a demand for work done, but it was a strategy because housework was not meant to be paid, first of all. So even to demand a wage for it already had a transformative character in the activity itself and in the subjects of that activity. So for example, when we asked for wages for housework and we said it many times, we were not making a kind of union demand. Okay, so this is the work we will be doing, let, let's uh, negotiate a contract, but we were actually saying, okay, this cannot continue to be as it has, because this has made the work invisible, has made us dependent, and et cetera, et cetera, has devalued our life, has devalued the life of the people that, uh, you know, the housework was intended to reproduce. So we saw it as a strategy to change power relation and not as an end of a struggle, you know, not as a demand only for some money, not that the money would not be important, 
but uh, this was never to be an end point. It was a moment in a long process of what we conceptualized as a long process of struggle and a strategy that in a way was provocative uh, with regard to the old, uh, you know, emphasis of much of the feminist movement on emancipation through wage labor. And, you know, many women had gone through wage labor <laughs> and they had not been emancipated. And, uh, you know, in our view, it was very clear that the situation of women in the home, that primary responsibility for the productive work, you know, that identification and uh, with unpaid labor uh, and the weakness attached to it, you know, the naturalization of the production, the, all of that had a tremendous impact, you know, on the kind of employment, for example, on the kind of conditions the women could negotiate also when they went outside the home. And I think that uh, the COVID epidemic, you know, has shown very, very, very clearly. Now women are being sent back as long as uh, that function is naturalized, you know, as long as women can be the recipient. We know women are there and we can always unload, take them out of the home when there is a need for them in the wage workforce, push them back, you know, when the need is not there, put more care work on them. Like, that all of that, you know, the idea of wages for house was, was precisely that the condition that we have experienced, you know, with COVID could not exist, could not exist because you wouldn't have this, you know, the assumption, you know, of a woman whose uh, work day can be stretched in every direction to accommodate all kinds of need depending on the needs of the labor market. So this, this and I think uh, to me, in a sense, the spirit of that demand and the rationality behind that demand is still completely valid today. And, you know, when I spoke of the rich handleries of resources, I mean, I always make this as like a slogan, you know, but this is the scandal of this society that uh, puts a big premium productive labor on uh, you know, an armed factory or a worker producing weapons, but uh, you know, has no compensation for a woman who is reproducing life, right? for a woman who is doing all the services that uh, are necessary for the reproduction of life. So, I mean, the question of rich handling of uh, you know, the, the I think that, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, the feminist movement and uh, many feminists have internalized the same kind of uh, devaluation, you know, of reproductive work, you know, that uh, is typical of the capitalist organization of work, you know, has internalized that devaluation and everything but domestic work, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, um, actually, I think uh, as part of a transformative struggle and uh, the creation of a vision, another vision for our production, you know, we also have to rethink the fact that reproducing human beings can be an incredibly creative work, certainly much more than producing cars. You know, and so and certainly much more than producing weapons, but the condition under which we have been forced to reproduce our life as being so oppressive, you know, so conducive to dependence, so suffocating that a lot of women do not want, and I think it's really a major problem, and that we'll have a feminism that will reverse that trend. I've been sitting here thinking about the common sense of anti-capitalism 
Um, and I, I, I love the idea that for lots of people, and I think the last year should be building a new common sense uh, in terms of uh, rejecting the absolute lunacy in which we live under, right? Like where you were made to go to work for the last year while 120,000 people died in this country. Um, and actually, maybe if you hadn't gone and done your meaningless, stupid bullshit job, you might have been able to be involved in other different activity that could have helped more and more people be alive, right? And I think hopefully, that is the kind of common sense that people are walking away from this uh, last kind of 12 months with. I worry, as Sylvia does, that I think that a huge amount of devaluation uh, has actually happened in the last year to socially reproductive work. Um, and I, I wonder about the smugness as well. I just wanted to kind of bring up because when we think about these kind of new anti-capitalist kind of ethics and common senses, I think we've got to make sure that within those kind of new common sense, we are doing that work of revaluing life-making work. Um, because I saw an awful lot of posts uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and a couple of weeks ago at the height of the third lockdown of people kind of smugly being like, well, aren't you glad you don't have kids? Uh, you know, I'm really glad I don't have children right now. And what a slap in the face that was, you know, to all of the 44% um, of households across the country that do in fact have dependent people living with them um, and the kind of shit year that we've all had as a result all being together. Um, and But not only just a slap in the face, but a kind of real misunderstanding around what solidarity was needed over the last 12 years to kind of break out of the I'm all right, Jack, um, gee, it really must suck to be my neighbours at the moment as I'm listening through the wall to the absolute chaos of what it means to keep X amount of people under a, you know, a roof for 24 hours a day. And I think it's about recognising that uh, huge amounts of things have to change for us to do that revaluation. In the here and now, it means paying your childcare minder or your child or your nanny or you're the person who works at the childcare centre more money in the here and now. But in the long term, the struggle to be able to pay them more money and to think of their conditions as connected to your conditions means that we have to change the very understanding of what care means, right? And, and how care is integrated into capitalism. It might mean that our professional middle class kind of jobs become less important uh, and some other kinds of jobs become way more important and not just more important in terms of what we pay them but more important in terms of a whole value matrix around actually the work that uh, you know is considered essential and needs to keep going. In terms of co-ops I think that co-ops are really obviously they have a huge tradition in the United Kingdom um, and they offer a really interesting um, method and model and methodology for thinking about socially reproductive work because I think that co-ops force us to think in alliances uh, in different ways and usually if they're done right as opposed to like the co-op bank and a whole range of other you know fake co-ops usually they don't mean making a profit do they usually they mean good conditions good wages and all the money that's generated from that activity gets pumped back into the resource and really if you were thinking about elder care or child care or disability support that would probably be the method that you'd go with if you were thinking about people at the center of that problem and not profit so of course co-ops or a form of worker and consumer control um, is what I think Sylvia is talking about in terms of we get the money from the state because it's ours and then we need to control how it's actually um, used as opposed to at the moment being pumped into private companies. Oh, that was a very interesting question about wages and cooperation. And um, I don't have an answer, but I would like to expand the question because I hope it might be something actually in another session we might think about. But partly why I'm interested in issues about changes in work and precarity is about what that does to our sense of, even as workers, how we organise, which then has implications for how we think we organise as not workers or what those components are. So we already live in a world where um, if you have a wage, you're likely to have not a minute to yourself. And if you're, even if your wage covers your living costs, it gives you no time to live. Huge sections of the world who are underemployed or unemployed, who have a really limited access to many of the means of life because they're not productive workers or they're kind of precarious in the workplace in and out of it. And within all of this, a kind of invisibilizing of most forms of care work not only childcare, but all of these other kinds as well. Um, 
And I think also, you know, I absolutely hear why childcare, but I'm also interested in, even if you never want to have children, you are going to die. What do you think is going to happen to the towards the end of your life? So, you know, of course, you know, I have children as well. But I understand some people don't have children. I don't know anyone who doesn't have mortality. So that's a kind of different kind of question about what are we to each other? What are our collective claims? And how would we articulate those our collective claims and goals? And I think there's something bigger or a different space that we need to think about. And I really think, you know, the question about the wage form is very core to that. When I'm kind of burbling on about, oh, how disappointing mainstream unions are, and I'm a mainstream trade unionist, and I spent 30 years of my life being a mainstream trade unionist. Part of that is about the claim is only made to the employer. So your ideas about your conditions and wages, that's you and your employer. And, you know, and I, I sell that a lot of the time because who is the power in your life? That's where that struggle happens. And every time you move it along, you move things along more generally for everyone. But if we live in a world where only some people even have direct employers, a whole load of other people work, but who knows who their employer is, their employer's hiding, and a whole lot of other people don't work, our collective survival requires something beyond a kind of over-focus on the individual value of the wage in one sector and one workplace. Now, that's not getting us all the means of life, including the people who the wage earner cares for, lives with, lives alongside, even the kind of interdependencies of the wage earner, which is partly why I'm interested in what happens under precarity to social reproduction, which I think is dispersed and financialized, but also dispersed in other more unpredictable ways. So I think there's something about how we think of class solidarities, which tries to learn from what we've all learned collectively for decades and centuries about the wage relation, but then places the wage relations only one of the relations about what access the means of life are, which both Camille and Sylvia write on in, in different ways about what, what is access the means of life? How do you make that claim? How do we organize ourselves um, to make that something that can be enacted? Because liberation, you know, everyone must have access to the means of life. That's the baseline of liberation. No liberation till we all have access to the means of life. And I think that's where the co-op comes in, isn't it? As a model that people have trialed in different ways. And it might be an interim model of how you um, create a service of mutuality and mutual support in the meantime. But it's also kind of a practice of what would a world in which collective access to the means of life what might, how might you organize it? What might our relations to each other be? Because it's also about saying our relations to each other, what if they were not mediated through the market? How do we even begin to say to each other, what do we need to stay alive? How do we make sure it all gets done? How do we try to live with and accept the fact that we are frail and needy and mortal and we will all be those things sometime? Then what is our bond to each other? Now that's a big, question which I think is absolutely the heart of anti-capitalist kind of thought in exciting ways but it's almost never how we yet speak to each other so I hope that we'll have a bit more of that soon. Thank you so much for that. Uh, of... Yeah sure. Yeah yeah you know I think all this is very important I, I want to ask a uh, about precarity, I understand. I, I'm just been reading. Um, I'm sorry that the sun is coming all into my into my space, <laughs> and I've been reading, you know, uh, the book by Emma Dowling that just was published by Pluto no Vorso, and uh, it's about the care work crisis. In fact, it's all about care work. It just was published. And um, one of the things that she begins with is uh, connecting to your question and the precarization of life and precarization of work and the condition of care work in that. And one of the things she's talking about, which I'm becoming more and more aware is uh, the spreading now of zero hours work contract. Zero hours. I mean, I don't know how many people are aware of it. But this is a very diabolical new relation to work. It means you have a contract that does not guarantee you any hours of work and does not guarantee you any wage because if you don't work 
any hours of work you will not be paid, but requires you to remain available. And the situation now is such that many people are actually, and I imagine mostly women, signing up for it. And in fact, it shows that many have to do with care workers uh, are, are in that, right? So we're really moving. And we see then, you know, expanding on a more global level. It's very clear that uh, as we are having you know, massive displacement, you know, millions of people being thrown off, you know, the jobs they had, the land they have, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, most of them do not become wage worker. It's now been uh, a kind of analysis from the global south, the informalization of work, which means that, you know, income and so on, it's all always a big question mark, right? So the, as a model, in fact, the wage, the security, the employment is really, which shows the, the importance, in fact, of those movements in the 60s that took on, criticized the whole Marxian scheme, you know, of the wage work being, uh, you know, the terrain of liberation of humanity from exploitation. And so this is very important in, in precisely in, in terms of thinking the whole range of so-called benefits, right? And that's very point one. The other point I wanted to make that connects uh, Gatti to your point, yeah. And this is like to the younger generation because I was one of those women who very early said, I'm not going to have children. I don't want to do housework. I will never have children. And I've done so much housework in my life. And uh, not having children does not, does not um, prevent you from doing a huge amount of, because you still have relatives, you still have a mother and father, you still have lovers, you still have friends who become sick. And I want to say something because we should not forget that the work of reproduction and housework and care work is not only the work of allowing people to live, is also the work of helping people to die. And that is one of the most laborious and difficult and painful work that exists on this earth. And it's work that is done primarily by women. We are the one who live longer than everybody else. And it's because we have the responsibility not to die, because we are the ones who always help other people, you know, when they're sick and also when, uh, you know, and, and I think that, that is extremely important. And um, yeah, the question of cooperative and the question of communal structure, the question of structure and infrastructure of reproduction, reproductive infrastructure that are not connected to having a job, that are not connected you know, to, to basically the whole organization, capitalist organization of work. The do are connected to a process of recuperation, reappropriation of wealth. We cannot disconnect this initiative from the reappropriation of wealth. Otherwise, we only redistribute our poverty. And that, that is very important. And then depending on the situation, there are many, the cooperatives for sure, I mean, I've always looked at uh, being inspired by the situation in Latin America, where they have the, the collective kitchen, where they have uh, the collective you know, garden, urban farming, and et cetera, et cetera. These are all, there's a huge, now already underway experimentation, yeah, with uh, beyond the, the, the nuclear family and beyond with, with the crisis of the male wage, the nuclear family, it's, it's, it's also an historic crisis. And um, so the need for other forms of reproduction, collective forms of reproduction, this is really now on, on the historical agenda. <laughs> And just quickly to jump in, I know Elif that you have one more question, but I just wanted to add one very simple thing that I think is good for people in the United Kingdom to think about, and that is to struggle, the struggle of the wage and against the wage and beyond the wage, like everywhere else in the world, has to do with land. 
right? And that's something that I don't think Brit people in Britain really think about very often. And that's because we were driven off having any connection to the land hundreds of years ago, very violently and very effectively. But the same people that did that driving off, you know what, here's the kicker, their fucking grandchildren still own that land, right? So that historical process hasn't ended and really is at the heart of what revolutionary politics needs to come to grips with in, in the United Kingdom. So if you've just tuned into hating the royal family because of how they're treating like Megan, right? Um, then I think it's really important to fit that into actually how we think about reproduction and about regaining and reclaiming land that is rightfully ours and has always been ours has to just become part of what the future looks like in Britain. Now that sounds crazy, I know, right? Uh, it takes us back to the levelers and the diggers and periods of time that seem so long ago, but quite frankly, with the climate crisis, the, cl the crisis in social reproduction, and now the economic crisis of what, what happens when, uh, when we're made to pay back supposedly this money that doesn't exist, which it does by the way, um, then I actually think questions around land, around food production and about who we think should feed us uh, in the coming decades is at the heart of what working class struggle needs to kind of tackle in Britain. I mean, thank you so much for everything that um, you all raised in this round and particularly around the connection to land and the, strugg the land struggles and food. These are also things that we'll be um, exploring in uh, upcoming sessions too. So thank you very much. Um, I have, I think one last round um, of questions. Now these two questions are somewhat related, but also I think like if we had like hours and hours would definitely require like their own kind of like standing, but I'm going to ask them both because I think they both need to be addressed. And just to say, there's been so many questions, so many comments. So thank you very much for everyone watching and for being so engaged in the discussion. It really is a testament to how crucial this discussion is. And, and also a lot of the points that have come up really do make way for like further discussions, further public discussions. And the public element of that, I think, is really, really crucial and will be, you know, continue to be crucial for a long time. So the questions I wanna uh, put to you is, uh, where do the panel see sex workers fitting into the reproductive labor that is being exploited under COVID? And what is the, what is the best way to organize for this? And the other one, again, somewhat, you know, there's, of course, there's a relation, but I think they're also two separate questions is how can care workers, formal and informal, best manifest their power? The seeming contradiction of withdrawal of care for, for societal improvement is a hard sell for a lot of care workers that takes a big, uh, that takes a big mind shift. Are there other forms of effective action that can lead people to that place? So I guess the question generally, and I think it's quite well framed, is what is the future and how can we bring about that future? So let's start maybe the other way around this time. Gargi, do you want to go ahead and then we'll have Camille and Sylvia to, you know, come in. Um, I'll try and be quick because, of course, people aren't here to see me. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think um, certainly I'm, you know, I think we're witnessing much more energetic sex worker organization you know labor force sex worker organization in britain than um i've probably seen in my political lifetime before not that it hasn't happened before but it's got much much further um i think the only thing i'd say is that the attempt by the dominant culture to split social reproductive work into respectable and disrespectable forms of social reproduction that's part of clearly what splits us from each other. I'd say that's actually a parallel to racial capitalism, that you know, it's a way of having good and bad bodies, good and bad gendering, but, you know, and that the organisation around sex work is, of course, core to that. It's more than just workers' rights. It's a whole kind of reframing of what um, social reproduction is and what the different kinds of care work are. In terms of interim demands, I, I really hear what people are saying, and, and I think and I'm sure Camille will talk about it more, but clearly the people who are working around um, organising the care sector, you know, all of their business is about finding the interim demands. But I still think that part of the work of anti-capitalists is to keep in play more than the interim demands. 
you know, one of the difficulties about um, living in a world that doesn't want you to stay alive is that you could get stuck your whole life fighting out for an interim demand that wasn't even quite what you wanted. So that's also, that's always our job, isn't it? Keep in play the interim demand that will keep me alive today, but don't let that um, colonise your own mind. Because even, you know, because that's part of us keeping in, our, you know, I, I hear that that's what, Sil when Sylvia says like kind of levels and stages, that's partly what I hear. To keep in play the other level is what changes an interim demand from being um, a, an unuseful reform to being something that will keep you alive today for the next phase. And I, and I think everyone in the room probably sees what I mean by that. Um, so picking up the question around sex worker rights organizing, um, uh, I agree with Gargi that we're seeing um, some of the most militant and organized um, forms of sex worker articulations of politics than we have in a generation. Um, that's kind of a decade worth of hard graft of organizing that in the last three years has come together in a union. Now, you will uh, not be surprised to hear that the sex workers are organizing with the childcare workers who are organizing with the cleaners uh, all together in one big base union. Now that's not uh, just a coincidence, that's uh, a certain feminist perspective that is trying to build a reproductive workers union and is deliberately and purposely making people say the words sex worker and childcare worker in the same breath and that makes everyone uncomfortable right because you can't talk about prostitutes and children. Um, and so uh, beyond uh, just trying to play around with a bit of stigma there, um, beyond that I think in terms of the pandemic what have we seen? All strip clubs have been closed down. Um, they got closed down, I just might add, two weeks after we made a huge historic victory in being able to claim that strippers in the UK were in fact workers um, and had access to workers' rights like sick leave and holiday pay and a whole variety of things um, and could not be victimised for trade union activity, the most important of our workers' rights in many ways. Um, and we've seen that full service work, prostitution work um, initially was incredibly disrupted. And I think what we will have witnessed now is that a lot of that work has take, is taking place, but is taking place even further marginalized, uh, further criminalized mm -hmm. and further um, made even more dangerous. Uh, and so um, I think there is a huge section of the feminist movement who would like to keep all of that exactly as it is. Um, and we've seen that with sections of the Labour Party, um, Labour Party women moving to criminalise the purchase of sex during lockdown um, and generally talking about how um, how great it is uh, what the pandemic has done to the sex industry, whilst at the same time, sometimes being able to murmur about how difficult um, it has been obviously for the women and men and trans people involved in the sex industry. One thing I think that 10 years or 15 years worth of organizing has enabled us to bank on uh, was actually transformative and radical processes of, um, of mutual aid. And I just would flag up that the sex worker advocacy resistance movement swarm here um, was able to raise uh, a quarter of a million pounds uh, in money to be and that was given directly to sex workers in the first few months of the pandemic um, and that level of um, solidarity and support that was shown was clearly on the back of actually over a decade worth of really deep organizing that wasn't just on the back of uh, you know some influencers on Instagram retweeting uh, that kind of thing right like if you want to earn uh, raise that kind of money for a stigmatized or marginalized community you actually have to have done the hard yards. Um, so some of uh, I, I totally agree with what Gagi was talking about in terms of that relationship between the here and now struggles and the demands that we make um, and questions around reform and keeping on the horizon the idea of transformation um, and the relationship between the change we make now and the kinds of change we're trying to produce in total. Uh, I think some of what I was just talking about in trying to bring together different subjectivities that have been historically held apart 
um, and that are held apart for a very good reason in terms of that are some of the foundational processes of keeping production and reproduction separate is the task of, of how we tackle reproduction, is about is making visible the, the divisions and the separations that divide us and that divide our lives and our time spatially and, and our bodies and deliberately bringing those divisions and making them visible to ourselves in our organizing and in our politics and in our ways of life. And then seeing what happens when we try to um, uh, try to come at a force at those divisions. I don't think you can plaster over them. I think you have to understand what some of the deep historical divisions are um, and, and that it's not just a process, obviously, of people being nice to each other. Um, uh, but I think that understanding how those divisions exist and how they keep people apart um, is a really useful part of of, of devising a strategy that enables us to think about not having separation as the main way um, in which our political economy kind of functions. Uh, and then, because it begs the question of what kinds of connections do we want? What kinds of togetherness and what kinds of coming, uh, what kinds of uh, moments of collectivity uh, are we interested in? And I think that people have to be a little bit brave um, as well in terms of I think it'll be a bit uncomfortable. Um, and so and that uncomfortableness, I think, is part of what struggle is. Um, and on those questions of care, I think that there is a process like what Sylvia has ta been talking about, about insisting that we have to have a feminist movement um, that fights for something other than scented candles and self-care um, and a bunch of brands uh, that supposedly care about us. Um, and instead, imagines a world where um, having access, as Gagi was talking about, having access to the means of life is the very base condition. Uh, everyone having access to the means of life is the very base condition of liberation. Um, and I think that that starts by focusing in on the questions that we've been talking about tonight in terms of the questions of production and reproduction. Over to you, Sylvia. I completely agree. I mean, you cannot have liberation without uh, the material condition of liberation is access to the means of our reproduction. <laughs> Absolutely. I just only want to add a couple of things because I think you, you know, you're they're very, uh, what you said is, is perfect. Um, on the question of sex work, I want to say that uh, there is uh, something dangerous afoot coming from the European community. And of course, now Britain is outside of the European community. But what is happening, and I learned about it by recently, because I, uh, a, a group of sex workers in, uh, in Seville contacted me and to say uh, that. Uh, what the European community is trying to do right now is to criminalize, this is a very old strategy, to criminalize those who are renting buildings to sex workers or any, not only renting building, but anything connected with uh, any form of sex work and has to be criminalized. And of course the people who, you know, uh, how you say, uh, building the owners of building, of cafe, parlors, etc. And of course, this is a way of criminalizing sex work without saying it. And, you know, I said, this is the, the struggle that began the big sex workers movement in 1975 in Lyon when the sex workers occupied the famous Church of Saint Nazir, you know, originated exactly from that concern, you know, sex worker being forced to go, you know, into the streets or forest woods outside in the periphery in areas where there'll be much more of a, and ironically, and this is where I think it needs uh, some denunciation and exposure because it is being promoted as a defense of the life of sex worker, as an anti-violence, whereas it is exactly the opposite because puts it much more in danger, you know, exact. So they are still at work, you know, they are still at work at a time, as Camilla was saying, in which internationally, you know, we are seeing actually sex workers organization making all kinds of alliances, being able to make a kinds of alliances, you know, with other um, proletarian women's organization, 
you know, like domestic work as we see it in, in Spain, for instance, very clearly, and so on. Now the state comes in and, and tries, in fact, a new, a new push to criminalize sex workers. And the other point is about, you know, Gagi, what you were saying about the, the whole issue of uh, not getting stuck, <laughs> not getting stuck in the, in the intermediate, right? So the intermediate becomes the ultimate. You know, and I think also the way many times people looked at wages for household, they, they looked at it as it was like the end point, as if we were saying, this is the revolution. Once we have the, and uh, we, no matter how much we, we said, no, it's a strategy. It's, but uh, I think because for a long time, the dominant trends within the women's movement were not thinking from the point of view of anti-capitalist strategies. They were thinking in terms of, how we get women's equality, how we get, et cetera, et cetera, how we get more power, and not in terms of a long process of anti-capitalism, of a transformative process. Feminism as a transforming, not only dealing with women or, or with the question of equality or the question of improving condition, as all these are important, but uh, within a transformative context. I wanted to say just issue that um, the issue of reforms. That is very important to learn and examine carefully reform. There are reforms that are lifting the bottoms. They are lifting the bottom for everybody. And those reform rare, very rare, those reform are the ones that we fight for. There are reforms that are pacifying, that are satisfying the need of one sector of the working class and then pushes the other even further down. The New Deal, which has been celebrated in the United States as a big, in reality now with a more critical eye, people can see that a lot of black people, black workers, domestic workers were all excluded from it. That it actually guaranteed the needs of a certain sector of white uh, wage worker. And so it is very important. It's not the form of revolution. It's what kind of reform? It's a reform that divides us that is actually used to divide people and fragment the struggle by, by satisfying selective needs, or they are reform that in fact actually give everybody the power to struggle you know, in, in, a, in a better relation. And that's this, uh, yeah. Um, thank you so much uh, for this really, really incredible discussion. Um, I just want to flag again that the YouTube live stream, live stream chat has been so lively. It's been really, really incredible comments and also questions, um, also quite wide ranging. I want to, I want to just quickly, there's some very important questions we didn't get the time to address, particularly around um, children with, with uh, special educational needs particularly, um, you know, the care work around, uh, you know, disabled people, but also the care work disabled people also provide. Um, I think all of these, of course, require a, a real, um, a real focus and also real, real, like meaningful time to address. Um, and I didn't want to just, you know, ask them in a throwaway way, because we, we didn't really have time. Um, but yeah, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, Sylvia. Again, thank you, uh, Gagi. I think this has been a really crucial and also um, timely discussion that really needs to uh, continue. Just lastly, um, if you want to become a member, please visit theleftbookclub.com. And uh, at the bottom of our homepage, you can also subscribe to our newsletter to keep up the date with these events. Uh, follow the Left Book Club on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And again, while you're still here, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our next event, and these are um, these are also based on uh, some themes and topics that have uh, come up during this discussion. Our next event will be on our book that we published last month on um, Class Power on Zero Hours by the Angry Workers Collective. That'll be on the 25th of March. If you follow our um, accounts on social media, you'll be able to 
uh, register for it and see more details for it. Our next event of this series in April will be on anti-capitalism and food. That will be on the 15th of April. Again, very important uh, themes that came up during this discussion as well. Again, once again, once again, thank you very much for everyone who joined us on live stream. We had people joining from all around the world, which was really amazing to see. Thank you very much to our incredible speakers and we hope to see you again soon.